In a world that's both more connected and more isolated than ever before, we're often tempted to do life alone, either because we're so busy or because relationships feel risky and hard. But science confirms what faith communities have always known, that consistent, meaningful connection with others has a powerful impact on our well-being. We are meant to live known and loved, but so many are hiding behind emotional walls that we're experiencing an epidemic of loneliness. Join us in this four-week series to help you find your people. Hey, this is uh, the first time, this is, a, this is the first time, did I turn it off? Yeah. Oh, okay. So there we go. There we go. <laughs> I just got too many bad habits. This is the first time that the three of us have done like a conversation sermon yep. all yes. in one place. I, we need to take a selfie of this right now. Plus, we want to invite you to take oh, your, your cameras yeah. out. Coming. Shoot a selfie. Oh, a selfie. There we go. <laughs> Take, so take a selfie of yourself. I forgot selfie of I, was, I wasn't trying to bring that up. I was just. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It, it's a good selfie, though. The selfie of the week this week is, is Matthew, Matthew Tiffany. Tiffany. Yeah, they were awesome. It's, so, it's awesome. When, when you receive a call that your dad has died in Indianapolis, like at 9 p.m., who do you call to drive with you to Indianapolis from Lansing? Who do you call? I, I called Mark, yeah. uh, well, I texted you, with Jeremy Cracky and Dave Wassinger. And I said to you guys, you weren't around yet, I didn't even no. know you. Um, I said, I need somebody to drive to Indianapolis with me tonight. Which one of you can do it? And I, you, <laughs> you, you said you could do it because you're like, all my meetings are with you tomorrow yeah. anyway. So. <laughs> I just have them in the car. Yeah, yeah but, but you you actually drove. You drove me to Indianapolis to meet, well, to go to the... Do all the things. All the things, yeah, the funeral home or whatever, yeah. yeah. That, that, that's that's the, the, what we're dealing with today, friendship. Like, who do you call at 9 p.m. when you got to go take care of your dead dad? Yeah. Or whatever. And as we get into friendships today... I think you all realize this friendships can be a little complicated. We particularly realize this as pastors. Um, I don't know if you all realize this, but we can't be friends with every single one of you. <laughs> it's just, it's not possible. We don't have the relationship capacity. Um, also, as pastors, we often deal with like dual relationships, where like you have one relationship with another person and a second relationship with another person. And we just want to acknowledge at the start of this series, friendship can be tricky. Navigating those things can be tricky. Yeah, like Tom is my friend and also my boss. Yes. That's a dual relationship. And oh, yeah. yeah, so like, have you ever had a situation where you've needed uh, a friend at a very inconvenient time or maybe you've experienced something like this? I, I know for me, um, I, I remember a time when a child of mine, who will not be named, turned on a light in my vehicle overnight. And then when I woke up in the morning and we were like rushing out the door to go to school, well, the car didn't start. And so thankfully we had a friend in the neighborhood and he just came over at like 7.30 in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning and jump started my van and, and we made it to school on time. And I can continue with the car theme. Yeah. Uh, once my family car, we had one car at the time, Jan and I did, and it was stolen on MSU's campus. <laughs> Um, Jana worked out, she went out to go get in the car, and it was gone. And our kids were in daycare, and we were like, what do we do? We have no vehicle. No car seats. Um, we are stuck at MSU, we have no car seats. They stole a car with the car seats in the back. Who does that? And we had no way to get our kids from daycare. And so we called a friend, and we were like, help. We had, we had friends come and help pick up our kids. We had friends help get us home so we could get home, because we were stuck at MSU without a car. Who do you call when you... <laughs> Your car is stolen. You need to get somewhere. All this conversation about who you call reminds me of at the very beginning of the Bible, there's this really great verse that says, it is not good for the humans to be, al to be alone. Mm -hmm. Not good for the... Now, it's this not. is my own translation of this. There's actually in the Hebrew, there's a pun on the word like earth that the first human is made from the earth. So it's like hummus and human and 
And so, there's, literally, like, there's not male and female mm. at this point. There's just one human hummus. Mm. I know, you just made me hungry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is the theme verse for the whole thing. It is not good for the human or for humans to be alone. Um, which I, was, reminds me of an Instagram reel I recently saw. Nobody talks about Jesus' miracle of having 12 close friends in his 30s. <laughs> it's true. Facts. Right there. Yes. Yeah. Yep. That, yeah. So we're starting a new series this morning talking about this whole idea of finding your people. Who do you call? Who are your people? It's based on a book um, by Jenny Allen of that same name. And Jenny Allen looks like the kind of person, right, who has it all together. And you see her, and then you see her family, and her family looks like they have it all together. And you just think, surely she has never she have a hard time had a hard people. time with this. She's written books. She's got audio books. She's on podcasts. She's founded uh, a women's discipleship ministry called If Gathering. I mean, she's, she's got it all figured out, right? Or not. While writing her book on friendship, all her friendships fell apart. Yeesh. Her friendship circle fell apart. And in the midst of writing this book, she felt lonely. She felt isolated. She felt like a huge hypocrite. I mean, here she is writing on friendship, and all her friendships <laughs> were struggling at that Yikes. time. And, it, and it's a reminder that this stuff is hard. And even the author of a book on friendship struggles with friendship. I think it's especially hard when you're an adult versus when you're a kid. Yep. My son Sam is like just a friendship magnet. This is when we were camping at Silver Lake. I got to do the hand motion with this. One morning, <laughs> That's right. one morning he got up uh, and he had breakfast at the campsite. And then he said, well, I got to go make some friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to go. Um, and he did. Like, he just walked over to the playground. And, you know, five minutes later, he's friends with everybody on the playground. But it's not always that easy, right, when, <laughs> when you're, you're a little bit older. So we, what we like to do here at Sycamore Creek is we recognize that, uh, well, actually, there's a practical reason. People have an attention span. Yeah. And, it, like, 30 minutes is too long for you to just pay attention to us talking. But also, God doesn't just talk through us. The most important thing you hear this morning might come from somebody else. And that may be God speaking to you. So we want to give you a chance just to turn to somebody next to you. There's going to be a couple times in this message where you get to do that and answer this question. What's been your experience with friendship at younger ages compared to whatever age you're at right now? All right? So my own experience is that it was easier as a kid. Like, it just happened faster. Yes. Yeah. Then I don't know. Adult. I was so I was always an awkward kid. You were an awkward I, I kid. I was an. I, it was. It's always been a struggle. Hashtag socially <laughs> awkward. Absolutely. Yay. Yeah. Yep, okay. That's yep. me. Maybe true for some. Maybe not. <laughs> um, all right. So let's go back. Let's just remember. It is not good for the human, for you, to be alone. It's not good. Yeah. And the thing is that all of us, even those who are socially awkward, even those who are introverted, we're made for deep deep connection with other people. I think it's easier for extroverts to remember that, uh, to desire that, to look for it. But like introverts, we are, we're, we're made for that I'm too. I'm an introvert Absolutely. and I love like deep connection. Oh, yeah. It's just like the number of people I can have a deep connection with True. is fewer than yeah. the extroverts. Who <laughs> seem to, yeah. So God uh, existed in this sort of relationship before even we exist. And you think about the Trinity, the way that Christians think about God is one God and three persons eternally, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit from the beginning, always and all times. God is one and three. There's diversity, there's relationship, and there's unity yeah. in that. Yeah, sort of like a yeah. triangle is always three sides and angles, but it's, it's always one thing. Or I thought about this this morning, how Sycamore Creek Church is three locations, oh. but one church. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you can't push go. that metaphor too far. No, no, no. We, are, we are not divine. But, no. Okay. <laughs> I'm probably the only one who would think of that. Where do we see that at uh, in the Bible? What's, uh, what's the story where we see the Trinity at? Yeah, I think uh, mostly um, I think about the baptism of Jesus. Where Jesus is there, right, being baptized, and there's a, a voice from heaven, uh, which is God the parent, and then the spirit descends like a dove. And all three persons of the Trinity are there together, and they're one in purpose, in, in unity and community. So you can think about this. We are made out of relationship 
for relationships. relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've, I heard, I saw some of you mouthing that with me. We should probably all say that yeah, together. Yeah, that's a good we idea. We, we are, are made out of relationships, relationships for relationships. relationships. We're made in the image of unity and community. And we're not just built for community, but we are built because of the community of God. We are built for long, meaningful conversations and relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're built for the type of relationship where when you're having a bad day, a friend stops by with a beer and says, I know it was a tough day, here's a drink. You had that happen recently. Yeah, recently I did have that yeah. happen recently. Yeah. Yeah. Or it's like the people who show up early and stay late, right, to help set up and then help clean up. It's, it's those kinds of people. Or the people who celebrate the joyful moments of your life, but also the moments where you're in tears. Yeah. Yeah. And we need relationships where we hurt people and they hurt us, mm -hmm. but we work through it together. And we know that there's something on the other side of that hurt. And people who are on the same kind of mission with us, that, who have the same purpose. People who know that they belong to each other, that you belong with them. Now this is really hard in our culture because the beginning of our country was a declaration of what? Independence. 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 Declaration of independence. Right off the bat, we said, we are independent. Not a declaration of community, but a declaration of independence. Yep. So this, this is hard. It's hard to find community. It's hard to find meaningful relationships. And as we've acknowledged, it can be complicated and difficult to make new relationships, new friendships as an adult, uh, in part because the research actually shows that making new friendships as an adult, it takes more time. It's not easy to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this is nothing new. This has been happening for, for centuries, for millennia, uh, all the way back to Aristotle. He said, wishing to be friends is quick work. That's quick. But friendship is a slow ripening fruit. Mm -hmm. And why is that? It's because people make up the best parts of life and also some of the hardest parts mm -hmm. of life. Because if you go all in, right, if you just fully commit to someone, well, you're risking getting hurt. And you probably will get hurt at some point or another. Well. Some fears will come true. Some hopes will come true. But the connection, it, it costs something. To make this, these sort of friendships and relationships happen means that you're going to have to make a change. I was talking to somebody this past week, and they're like, what I don't have is the community that's going to help me do this. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, then you're going to have to live differently to build that. Their friendship Do doesn't just drop in our lap. No, yeah. yeah. And sometimes you have to, like, mm -hmm. even go down to reconsidering your daily and weekly routines. Like, where do you go grocery shopping? And where do you, like, you have to get down to the nitty-gritty of your, of your life. Yeah, you have to even, uh, we don't often think about this in terms of relationships, but where you live. Yeah. Where you live really determines who you can be friends with, the family that you have around you, and where we live. What do you plan to do impact. this weekend? Who are yeah. you going to spend time with? Yeah. The thing is that community is more than just having a few close friends. Like most of us think, oh, I just need a few close friends. And we do want that, but there's, there's something bigger that we need to support that. It, it's a whole social network that you need in real life. Now, this is where, Mark, you were referencing research on friendship. There's a ton of research on friendship, and we're going to give you a, mm -hmm. a basic, simple network or description of that. If you want to have five best friends forever, five BFFs, you have to have 15 people in your village. So you can't just focus on those five people. You have to have the 15 people that are like the next uh, group out. And if you want to have those 15 people, then you have to have acquaintances, uh, 50 acquaintances. And to have 50 acquaintances, you have to have 150 in your network. Now, the 150 in your network are not your five best friends forever. But you, it, there, there's this sort of building on top of each other as mm -hmm. people kind of move in and out of these circles. Our problem when it comes to friendship is we skip the village part. Yep. Most of us have the 150 network. Most of us have the 50 acquaintances. And if you're lucky, you've got five best friends forever. Most of us, who are those 15 in your village? And we skip thinking about building that. We do. And that takes us a bend back to our problem. It is not good for the human to be alone. It's not good for the human to be alone. We don't have this village built up around us. And if we want to move people from the outside of that circle toward the inside, it takes time. It takes time to move people, time experiences together to move from the outside to those BFFs in the middle. 
So as we think about those middle kind of stages, the village especially, what it takes to build that village is, is again, it's that time. Um, think about where you literally live. Where do you, do you shop at the same grocery store every week so that you can build connections with people? Uh, or do you have to drive 45 minutes? You know, think about those kinds of things. Where do you spend your life? Hmm. Yeah, proximity makes a big difference. And uh, again, going back to the research, we love the research, right? <laughs> Sociologists have identified the ingredients that need to be in place for us to make friends organically. And the way we do that is with continuous unplanned interaction and shared vulnerability. Continuous unplanned interaction where we're just close to each other and we run into each other helps develop friendships. And it's really hard to have unplanned interaction when we don't have regular rhythms in our lives, yeah. when we don't have that, that village of people that we are regularly interacting with. We hadn't done the work on this message yet when you came on to staff a year ago. In fact, this last week was your year anniversary. Yep. One year. Yeah. Woohoo! <laughs> We're going to celebrate that a little bit later in the service here. Um, but I had this intuition about this, like unplanned interaction and shared vulnerability. How do we bring you, like Mark and I have been around each other for a long time. How do, mm -hmm. how do you not just end up being a third wheel right. in this sort of friendship or whatever in this space? <laughs> right. So I had this idea, let's go on a pastor road trip up north where the three road of trip. us yes. are just are, are, in fact, my, my original vision was we were going to drive around the entire lower like peninsula like over multiple days. That was, that was, you know, your vision always starts here and then in reality. But, but we did. We went up and we spent uh, some time at a friend's house who has a house on Lake Huron, mm -hmm. just the three of us. And then after that, the staff came up for a staff retreat with us. And, uh, and we had a lot of, like, it was just, there's, there was no agenda for this time. It was just unstructured, planned time together and naturally, like, vulnerable conversations came up, just a three-hour drive up, like, yeah. getting to know mm -hmm. each other and talking. And somehow it ended up in a biker bar with a karaoke night uh, where this happened. I didn't know there would be a recording. I love that Matt is here as well, back Matt had a baby. This is the first time like, that Matt what? ever got up in his whole life to do karaoke. And Mark, who... You become a karaoke champ, right? Oh, yeah. Johnny Cash. I can talk a good game. I don't know if I can sing a good game, but I can talk a good game. Should we watch this whole video? No, I think we should. Let's, let's move forward, I think. Anytime now. Anytime. I'm trying to talk over it as much as I can. So here we are. Back to a question for you to talk with your neighbor. What does your network look like? What does your acquaintances look like? What does your village look like? We're not talking about your five best friends forever. We're talking about the next circles out. Let's take some time to talk about that. So I think that as we consider this question, right, like I'm still building a lot of these networks. I mean, it's been a year, but it takes time, it right? It takes time. What about you guys? What? Yeah. When I looked at that, it really reminded me of a faith community yeah. and the impact yeah. that a faith community gives you to have these groups of people. Like, you know, I look at the 15 and I'm like, that's a small group. Like when you're in a small group, yep. that's, that's the 15. Yep. Um, and not everyone's going to be your BFF in a small group, but that's okay. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. But you have a community built in at Sycamore Creek to help yeah. do some of this stuff. No, I think that the trap that we sometimes fall into as we consider this question or we consider connection is that, well, if I'm married and I have a spouse, that my spouse is my deepest connection. And, and maybe they are your closest, but like... And we think about this, this verse, it's not good for the human to be alone. We think about a couple. But all our relational and friendship needs, they cannot be fulfilled by one person. No. It's just impossible for that to be the case. I love you, Sarah, yeah. but you can't be everything. Nope. Like, nope. She's like, I don't, Get I'm on. good. I don't want to be <laughs> Yes. And we think overall about, you know, if we're going to really be healthy and we're going to have healthy friendships, we need to have God at the center of our lives. <laughs> Um, when we have God at the center of our lives, it helps us to be able to be a blessing to other people um, from that centering on God that we have. And so uh, the challenge is a lot of us, what we want to do is we want to put people at the center. Mm -hmm. and, and when we put people at the center, we're going to be constantly disappointed because we don't meet each other's needs perfectly. Mm -hmm. We need to have God at the center. And from that center...
we explore friendships with people around us. Mm-hmm. Now, you think of, you see this in the greatest commandment, right? Jesus said, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God, right? With everything you have. And then the second is love your neighbor. And it's the same thing when we're talking about friendship. It starts with the love of God, and then we extend to the love of our neighbor. And we see God doing that, like God building communities in this way. It starts with God, and then it goes out. And so there's, there's the couple, right? And then there's the family and the community. There's disciples, the church, the world. Ultimately, community exists to open the doors for everyone in the world to be invited into this community that will last forever. Mm-hmm. We see this. It gets lost in the Greek or in the translation to English, but in the Greek, a lot of the "us" in the New Testament of our Bible are plural "us." English only has like one "you." It's like "you," and then I guess there's "y'all" or <laughs> "you so, guys." South's contribution to yeah, yeah. Trans- so once again, I'm taking, I'm putting on my <laughs> translator hat. I'm gonna give you like this is an example, by the way, of it hits different. Like when you. When you know that the you is plural, the verse hits different than right. when it is a singular you. So here, here's the Southern translation. Don't y'all know that y'all are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in y'all? And all, all y'all. All y'all. All y'all. All y'all. There we go. All y'all. Yeah. So um, <laughs> that hits different, right? Like uh-huh. it, it's, not just, it's not just saying, Mikkel, you are God's temple, but... Right. All y'all. y'all, like we together, the community is God's temple, not just it. Now you're part of it, but together yeah. we express it better than we do alone. Absolutely. And the, the key to having healthy friendships is that y'all, it's, mm-hmm. it's the village that's around us. Different friends are going to play different roles in our lives. You know, one friend might be an encourager. Another friend might be someone who challenges us and kind of points things out to us. Another person might be a helper. You know, the, the person that you need to get something done. Another gonna, person might provide wisdom. You're going to get us talking about the Enneagram now. No, we're not going there. The Enneagram. Not Tom's favorite. <laughs> I have a joke. Like, you go to any conference, it's like, how long before the Enneagram comes up? And it's usually in the first keynote, like, address. Um, So you you think about uh, like the three of us and we play different roles in in our relationships together. Like you do something different than Mark does and vice versa. And that reminds me of C.S. Lewis, uh, who is the author of the Chronicles of Narnia. And in his book, Four Loves, he talks about the importance of like having multiple friendships. As in each of my friendships, there is something that only some other friend can fully bring out. Yeah. Like when Anna Maria is up here singing, there's something that Anna Maria brings out of me that's different than what you two bring out of me. Like mm-hmm. it, it, they bring different things out. Lewis goes on to say, by myself, I am not large enough to call the whole person into activity. We can't pull every facet of every person out. Lewis goes on, I want other lights than my own to show all of his or her facets. Like three friends is always better than two. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Your friends, they, they don't necessarily have what it takes to, to pull everything out of you. They don't. Yeah. And if you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and this couple, right, you can find some keys to friendships. So Jenny Allen has five keys to friendships. So the first one, proximity. Mm-hmm. Proximity to God and each other, like literal closeness. Yeah. Yes. The second one is transparency. Um, we need people who are vulnerable with, who are naked and unashamed with. Mm, like maybe, not, maybe, maybe not literally. But yeah, not yeah. literally, please. Yeah. We're not starting not a cult today. Yeah, yes. not, no, just, just transparent. No nudist church. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, nope. that's too far. It's different. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. too different. Yeah. yeah, okay. We need accountability. Like, and there's again in the garden. There's like this. There's equal submission to God and one another. It's only after the fall that you end up with hierarchy between right. human beings. It, it was a, there was an equality in the garden. And you need purpose, a clear calling from God. And in, in this first origin stories of the universe, it's like a, a call to care for the creation and for each other. And finally, we need consistency. We need people who we can work through conflicts with together and know that we're in the relationship together for the long haul. We won't quit on each other. 
So when you end up then, when sin enters into the world, you know, Adam and Eve eat the apple. They both eat it. Um, they, they're both there. Yep. They both come to the temptation and eat it. This, this whole thing gets broken. It and does. instead of proximity, you have distance. They're driven away from the garden. Instead of transparency, you have hiddenness. Where, you know, we have this shame and this guilt and we hide things from each other. Instead of accountability, you have selfishness. They did what they wanted rather than what God wanted. And this hierarchy was created. Yeah. And instead of purpose, there comes in domination. And there's a struggle with the creation rather than a desire to steward it and care for it. And finally, instead of the consistency that God wants for us, we have division. We're, we're, our relationships fracture. And we, you know, we see this very early in the Bible with Cain and Abel. And a very dramatic fracturing of their relationship that results in a murder. Now, <clears throat> what we need is a deliberate intention to return to the type of relationships that God would have for us. Again, this doesn't just fall in our, our lap. It doesn't just happen. It takes some work for us to return with God to what God intends for us to have, these five keys to friendship. Before I moved here to Grosbeck um, back in December, we lived in Holt. We'd lived in Holt for 13 years. And so I'm part of the Holt Facebook uh, community group. And any t like Facebook groups are like a... <laughs> They, they're, they're something interesting. else, right? They they're are something else, yeah. yes. Um, they hit different. They do hit different. <laughs> Not always in a good way. Um, but there was this one post one time that I thought was just absolutely beautiful, and I, I like, wrote it down so I could reference it. And, and this person wrote on, on the post, this is a little bit of a long post, but I want to read the whole thing because it, it brings everything that we've been talking about up here like right into like the world. It's not actually what's on the screen there, but let me read it to you. This, this person wrote, good afternoon, everyone. My family and I just moved into Stonegate over the weekend and would love to make more friends around the area. Like, this is, this is some of the beauty of, friend, of Facebook, right? You can build friendships. And so sh this person is reaching out, like looking for some new friends in the area that they've moved to. We've lived in Potterville, go Potterville, mm -hmm. for the last four years and have made one friend. It's my fiance. <laughs> It's a close friend. Yeah. Well, hey, that's a good outcome from Potterville, right? Yeah. Like, I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I don't think this is not, like, she's not slamming Potterville or anything. Yeah. She's yeah. just saying, like, that she's, she's realized she has to change. Like, she's moved to a different place, and her behavior, her actions have to change, right? So it's my fiancé and his nine-year-old daughter. So I guess that there's two there. Uh, but I don't know that I would call da daughters. And friends and parents are different than. Yeah. Um, so we're a little loud, funny, and chill family. We love having barbecues, play cornhole, etc. I'm also looking for mom friends in the surrounding area. I was told by multiple people in the Eaton Rapids page, so they must have been part of the Eaton Rapids like Facebook group, that um, that to look closer to our home because apparently 17 miles is just too far to be friends. And there was some wisdom in that, right? Like the the, the proximity. Yes. It, it's like who are the people like right around you? I'm hoping this reaches some of you on a personal level and would like to be mom buddies. Have a blessed day. Mm -hmm. and, and then when you read the comments, it was just like one person after another saying, I like barbecues. You can come up. Like, and I see this on a regular basis in our Facebook group neighborhood. Like yeah. face, people say, like, hey, we just moved in the neighborhood. We're looking for kids our kids' age, yada, yada. That's, that's it, like proximity and, and, and taking the intention to reach out and to do it differently. So we want to propose an experiment to you, or a challenge, Ooh. however you want to think of it. Connect deeply, connect with five people you're not currently deeply connected with now. So pick one person a week over the next five weeks and connect with them. Now, you don't have to go find new people, okay? <laughs> Just think about the people you already know. Who do you want to go deeper with? And intentionally connect with one person a week for the next five weeks. We're gonna we're gonna give people like some practical tips along the yes. way, right? Like, yes. So we're talking about like a lot your, of practical your, tips. You know, who's who's the person that where you work that you have lunch with instead of just having lunch by yourself, or or when you're dropping your kids off at school and you're standing outside the the school uh, and 
instead of just not talking to anybody, you talk to that one parent that you know, and you talk mm -hmm. a little bit more than you did yeah. before. So this is, this is an experiment. This is the challenge. Who is a person that you want to invest some more time in to develop a friendship there? That's already like in that acquaintance or in, to, we're trying to build your village here, okay? Yeah. Exactly. Now, a great place, as I mentioned earlier, to build all this is in a faith community. And a, a amazing thing, researchers have found this to be true. Um, this isn't something just unique to Christianity. This is unique to any faith community. It's a great place to meet people and, and to develop these friendships. And, and so what researchers from the University of Wisconsin found is that the devout are more satisfied with their lives than non-believers. And why is that? It's because of the friendships that they form within religious communities. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the power of having a faith community, a church that you are a part of. Now, Mikkel mentioned earlier that you have a groups and events brochure in your hand that you got when you came in today. There are so many opportunities in there for connection, for relationships to develop. And you know, we're giving you this five-week challenge, or maybe part of the five-week challenge is figuring out what group you yeah. can be in and what people you can meet through that group that you want to develop a deeper connection with. And speaking of groups, every fall we have a church-wide campaign. And in the past, we've typically had a book that we've put in your hands. Uh, this year, we're trying something a little bit different. It's called I've Been Meaning to Ask, and it's like a study guide and a journal. And so we'll have a series after this series where we're, we're preaching on it, we're talking about it, but also that is going to be the focus of our small groups for the fall. Um, and I can't wait to hear what you all think about this. Um, and then over the next four weeks, here um, and then into the fall semester, we're going to be looking at the five practices from this book, from Find Your People, which are proximity, transparency, accountability, purpose, and consistency. Now here's, I, I don't usually like to make guarantees, but I'm pretty close to making a guarantee. If you do this experiment, if you invest in five people, you will have at least one person in those five that you connect with on some deeper, they might not be best friends forever. Right. Mm -hmm. But you can't not invest in people and find one that you connect a little bit more with. So what if, what if we stayed in close proximity with the people right around us instead of like moving around based on our jobs or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. What if? What if we really had more people that we could be fully transparent with? that we had friends who we could challenge and be challenged by. What if we found deep purpose together in our mission as a church, our mission to share God's love with the world around us? And, and what if we stuck with relationships, even in the midst of conflict, even when we, we don't always see eye to eye, but we work through it together? What if? I think we'd find our people. We would, we'd find yes, our people. Would. So here's one more question for you. It's an accountability question. What next step can you take to deepen your friendship? Turn to somebody based on what we've talked about. Or sometimes I always say like there's the sermon that we're giving up here and then there's the sermon that's going on in your head. And that might be like what the Holy Spirit is talking to you. So that sermon might be more important. But what's the next step for you based on what's been happening in this space you've made to be here today? Let's talk about that. 